<laughs> okay, hold on a second. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was checking my audio before. Okay. Hello. Hello I don't know why I, I thought you were a girl. Like for some reason when I was talking to you, I was convinced I was talking to a woman. Okay. I'm so sorry. I had no idea I was talking to a man. Hi. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Not that it matters. You know, I just thought it was gonna be some girl energy, but it's all good. No problem. Hi. Okay. Well, I'm Thank a therapist, so I, 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 I no, it's it's a pleasure. I'm a therapist, so I, I I do like to listen and talk. So don't worry, it, it will be almost like a girly talk. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. it's yeah. fine. Hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's yeah. funny because sometimes you're like, okay, you have this idea of someone that you text or talk to. Yeah. Sometimes you think it's like an old man or old lady <laughs> or whatever. You know what I mean? And you see the person, it's like you're nothing, like I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> oh lord that's the best right time. but it yeah. doesn't matter it's fine hi <laughs> you know i've um over the past two years i've interviewed close to 80 from elder barge to swv um sinise I, I, i'm almost losing count when i told my wife that i'm interviewing interviewing you she almost freaked out my wife has not wanted serious? to she has not wanted to, to i've told about oh, everyone from black street nope doesn't bother her that I is said, so nice. So you have to bring her. Is she around? You have to come say well, hi. I'm going to wake her up because she's, she's asleep. Uh, but okay. And the reason okay. is, is that, um, and I didn't even make the connection. So we, 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 we're, we're here in England. So X Factor started here in England. Oh, right. So yes, we course. remember a long time ago watching your audition. I completely had forgotten. And then, yes. so, when, so I knew you from ex-girlfriend. I was all over my head. And, and then when, when I, did yeah. this research and saw that and I showed my wife I said, remember this stuff and she says look I watch her edition once a week even till now that if I'm feeling serious? if I'm feeling um uninspired if I'm feeling okay, uninspired don't make me cry oh my if god I'm feeling how uninspired, sweet is that and if I'm feeling I'm gonna give up then I'd watch what Stacy said about Simon I don't want this music to die in me and then power oh through my and god. So if we relocate to Australia, it? I am going to blame you because that's my wife's dream. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so and she says, Stacey is my motivation. So um, <laughs> that is so cute. We lo I love that. And, you know, I'm going to tell you, that's why I do what I do. That's why I sing. And that's why I, I speak out. And I, you know, I've over the years, especially these last couple of years, I've been, become more, um, I want to inspire people. You know, I really, I've been, I started a nonprofit organization and we fed over 150,000 meals and mm. we partnered with other companies who fed millions of meals, Feeding America and um, other companies. And it's, it's about that. And when you, when you say that, I say, then, then my purpose is being fulfilled. So thank you for telling me that because that really moves me. That moves me because that's what I want to do. Like I literally have chills because it's definitely my prayer to create that effect on women, especially and especially obviously men too, but I have a heart for women as I am one who's been on a hard journey in my life who um, that journey start stopped being hard about four or five years ago when I met my life partner who changed my life and it took having someone strong come in my life and partner with me and remind me of how powerful I am and took away a lot of the, the rough the rough edges from what life had sort of taken me through and so my my full intention and my always my command in life for myself and my affirmations are that I create um, great effects on people and that my artistry impinges on people in such a great way that it inspires them to be great and, and I help people through my art form. So hearing that from you is so encouraging. It means that my work is being done. <laughs> yeah, no, and that, you know, that's really, it's a blessing to hear that. So thank you for telling me that. And by the way, I love London. I lived in London for a few years and I love London. It's really beautiful. Yeah. I lived in Canary Wharf for a long time. Okay, Canary Wharf. Yeah, that, that's that's no, now. That's our Wall Street now. That's our sort of our, our Wall Street right yeah, now. Yeah, that's the Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> but, but then what is? Yeah, it was that way when I was there. Oh, yeah, but talk about the Sorry? your 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 charity organization. Um, so at least we could probably just understand okay. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have a nonprofit organization. It's called the Stacey Francis Music Arts and Education Foundation. And we started this organization. We started it. We started the work of it in 2020, but it became a full 501c3 in 2021. 
But I went to Cape Town. I served wow. meals to schools, a school there that um, was only open for food incentive for children to come to school and eat twice a day. And obviously with COVID, the school shut down and the school still needed the support to feed the children. So I actually went to Cape Town and I served meals to them. We served um, one, just in one week, we did 3,000 meals for that community. Wow. Um, and But overall, We've done about 150,000 meals. I did a project called, um, I, I did a song called We Stand Together, which is up for a Grammy. And basically that song was in partnership with a company here in America called American Power and Gas. And they had partnered with Feeding America. And, and at this point, they, they fed millions of people. But my organization came in and we fed Brooklyn. So, because I, obviously I'm from Brooklyn. So mm -hmm. I went back to Brooklyn, which is, also parts of it are a food desert as well. So I went back and I fed there as well. So you can go to the Stacey Francis foundation.com and see um, pictures of our work. You can donate there. And um, we contribute to the arts. We cont I contribute to artists and um, you know, education is big. Obviously it's the, it's so important for children to be well fed so that they can get an education. It's hard to learn and focus and really yeah. for your IQ to increase when you're hungry, right. Yeah. Or sleepy or tired or dirty. Or, so yeah. um, unfortunately I didn't, when I, when I named my nonprofit, um, it was to support schools and to come in to help and maybe educate them in the arts. But we actually got pulled in the direction of feeding kids wow. and it was because these schools and these children, poor children needed, you know, food. And so it was, it's, it's been quite the journey. It was, um, it was what I expected. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a blessing. Yeah. I mean, I, I see pictures of your, of your, of your, of your, of your partner who is he an artist or does he's a it? phenomenal artist. Okay. He's a phenomenal artist. He's a fine arts painter. And um, he actually will be at Art Miami this week. Um, the biggest show in North America is called Art Basel. And we'll be down there showing his pieces. Um, he was there last year as well. He went to the Verona Arts Academy in Italy. And he's a phenomenal artist. He does, um, he, he actually, honestly, in ninth, ninth grade, he was painting anatomy and models and wow. models came to the school and he I mean he's just a phenomenal artist as well so yes he is I'll have to tell him that you mentioned him in this interview <laughs> no, I think the, the reason is is that because you mentioned that he, he he's he's how shaped and changed and inspired and and, and what, what would you think he brought to your life um because you know most of us from the outside would look at a New York girl and think, oh, you guys are tough and strong and stuff. So <laughs> what is it that he would have brought in that really sort of changed and shaped you to, to where you are now? Well, he, you know, he is European and um, he's, he's, he, he brings in that Italian flair. <laughs> <laughs> Rom and, um, the ran romantic. So that has helped me. <laughs> you know, I had somebody post on my, on Facebook the other day, we, I posted a picture of us at an event together and he was like, oh, you're looking more and more Italian every day. You know, he's like rubbing <laughs> off. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I did spend a lot of years um, being a little more tough and a little more angry than I really would choose to, you know, with the disappointments in the, in my career, in my life, or just not really learning um, how to handle life the way that I wanted to. And I did go through life many times by myself. Yeah. And so um, when I was actually living in London, I wrote down a list of, I asked my daughter, I was like, don't you want a daddy? And she was like, because no, she was, she's very spoiled. And she was like, no, I like it. Just, I like it with just us. And I was like, well, he could carry our luggage. You know, like I just started, <laughs> I was like, he could, he could make you some macaroni and cheese. You know, he could, so she was like, oh, she said, like, he can go with us to Disney World, you know? <laughs> so she, she started to like brighten up and literally like two months later, I met Alex. And um, when you say, what happened he's just a really gentle guy like he's super gentle and he's very very logical and you know he we communicate very I mean we we over communicate you know when there's some lack of communication you obviously you know this as and the work that you're doing a lot of people are just really upset with their partners 
And sometimes it's just a miscommunication or misunderstanding. And so he and I, we over communicate. We have a commitment mm-hmm. to not ever go to bed um, angry with each other, you know, which which is very, very rare anyway that we get angry. But um, we just, he just, I like having um, a man in my house. Like, I just like that. Like, I like the, I like being a wife and a mom and a, you know, and a girlfriend and a, you know, all those things that are labeled mm-hmm. in the household, right? As for a woman, what she's supposed to do. And, um, and so him coming into my life and sort of having that position, I didn't have, I don't have a hard time with that. I know some women would be like, oh girl, you know, <laughs> yeah. old women unite. And that's <laughs> fine. I just love, I love the family structure and I love that he gives me advice that is healthy for me and very constructive and it leads toward um, my greatest good. And I trust him, you know? And so um, that, that was validating, you know, it's very validating when you have a man in your life or a woman in your life who supports your goals and dreams, who, Mm. you know, who accepts every part of you, you know, because I still, obviously I'm very strong. I do have a strong opinion and I do, I'm very opinionated. I don't, that's not changed. Um, But he's accepted that in me and he makes me feel safe in being that girl, you know? Mm -hmm. And because of that, it makes me want to make him comfortable and make, take his advice because I trust that he is going to lead me down the right path. (laughs) Wow. You know, so there <laughs> yeah well, I, I, I yeah i don't want my wife to hear this because she's gonna then put more pressure on me to reform and <laughs> i'm hearing everything that she tells well, me and i'm what? like it's, oh man it's funny <laughs> that's so funny because i think i think that women i think honestly i do believe that women would be more willing to listen um to the advice of a man if they trust if they trust their man if they trust that they know that their future is safe with him and they feel safe. I mean, we just want to be safe, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, um, it's not hard when it when it go, when it goes there. But it is kind of hard to find a guy that makes you feel that way. Because sometimes it's not even about the guy. Sometimes it's about the woman where she is in her life. Like, is she in a place where she is willing to um, trust a person? Because sometimes, based on her past experience and her past relationships, she doesn't. She doesn't trust very easily because people Mm -hmm. have betrayed her too often. So fortunately, I had done a lot of work in this area um, on myself spiritually and emotionally. So by the time he came into my life, I was able to to trust him. Okay. You know, and that's where that's where the individuality comes in to this. You have to work on yourself and be willing to um, look at yourself. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel like a lot of times people don't want to take responsibility for the effects that they create. And um, and that was something that I really had to do as well. Like it's it you can't always play victim, you know. It, it, you can be a victim, but you can't always always be in that position. You have to at some point take over and decide that you're not a victim anymore. I think as a therapist, one of the struggles I have is that um, people um, from our community, black, whether it's an Africans or Americans mm-hmm. or black British. Mm-hmm. Don't feel therapy is for them. We rather go talk to our friend, mm-hmm. pastor in church, mm-hmm. or, or our neighbor. But we mm-hmm. would not get professional help. And 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 part of the mm-hmm. my platform is to try and 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 promote mental health and wellness, and 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 the fact that mm-hmm. it is not a stigma it should no longer be a stigma within our community. And hearing you talk about yeah. working on yourself, I, I would. Uh, did you get yeah. therapy as well, or was it other types of help that might have helped you through your journey? Um, yeah, I, I got a lot of help from my church Okay. and, um, I took courses and I did things that, um, I needed to do. I just needed to take more responsibility. And I mm. think like, it's difficult. I don't put any labels on, I'm not, look, I'm, <laughs> this is a very, this is a very touchy conversation because I am. I do know that people have to be willing to take responsibility for their their actions. And Mm -hmm. I think like sometimes people are in so much pain, it's hard to do that. Mm 
and they don't know where to turn to seek that help. You know, I grew up in a Christian church and that was where you went to sort of lay your problems down, right? <laughs> um, we live, a, <laughs> we sort of live in a different era now, you know, where there's all these mental health options, you know, you just have to be, be careful and, and know where you're looking. And I think when you say our community is a little reserved when it comes to mental health is because, um, again, it goes back to betrayal, you know, mm-hmm. and how we were, we have been betrayed in the past by, yeah. um, you know, certain industries. So I think that's the thing I think, but, but there's so many options now, like, you know, I, I, I just, I remember speaking of X factor, I remember feeling so broken and feeling so many people say, well, how did you decide to do the X factor? Well, I remember feeling so broken and I remember making a decision that I wanted to sing again and I wanted to just really get out there and do it. Right. And I wrote down, I started doing affirmations Mm. and, you know, speaking into my existence, the things that I wanted to happen, you know, and I, and I always suggest that for people to just speak positively, think positive thoughts about yourself, you know? Um, So I remember writing down that I wanted to meet Simon Cowell. I want to sing for Simon and you'll love this because you're from the UK. So um, I was, like a couple of years too old when, when American Idol started. And he was on this show called American Idol here in yeah. America. I did not know about the X Factor. A lot of people didn't know about the X Factor in America. Yeah. At the point where I found out about X Factor, I think it had been in the UK for 15 years. Yeah. And so um, I have a friend, because I did a show in the West End with my, called My Mom Went to Sing. I was the star of the show. Did you ever hear that show in the West End? No, okay, no. it played at the Gilgood. It played at the Gilgood Theater on Shaftesbury Avenue. Oh. And I played in another theater in Covent Garden, the Covent Garden Theater there called, the, I think it was the Cambridge Theater. So I lived in London for a year doing that show. And I had a lot of fans from the UK and one particular who had seen the show about 36 times, a British lady, she lives in Essex. Um, and so uh, she and her <laughs> daughter at the time would come to the show and they were big, big fans of mine. And so we always stayed in touch. And uh, during the time of the X Factor, when it before it came to America, when Simon quit American Idol, it was rumored that he was going to do a show called X Factor. And I was like, what is that? And my friend from the UK was like, this show is massive. Go to YouTube and see. And I had no, we honestly, Americans had no idea about this show, really. Yeah, yeah. So, and at that point, like I said, it had been on TV for 15 years in the UK. So I was like, oh my goodness. Okay, so I saw it and then I found out about Susan Boyle and then the fact that there was no oh, yeah. age range. And yeah. like, you know, I was like, oh my goodness, I have got to look and see what this show is about. And so I kept Googling X Factor, my friend in the UK kept Googling X Factor USA. When was it coming? And then it finally came up on a website that when the auditions were. And I wrote down, I want to meet Simon Cowell. I want to sing for him. I want him to give me a standard ovation. I want to win the X Factor in America. I mean, I wrote down all this stuff and I put his picture on my wall. Wow. And at the time, I was listening to um, the CD series called Your, Your, um, sorry, yeah, Your Wishes, Your Command. And it was by Kevin Trudeau. And I remember all the steps he was talking about, like being healthy, taking vitamins, you know, don't eat a lot of sugar, like keeping yourself healthy because you emanate the ability to create your reality through your mind, Mm. you know, and that we're energetic beings and what it takes to create your reality. Right. And I was like, okay, this sounds cool. I'm just going to listen to this and I'm going to put my attention on meeting Simon. And I did that in February. And I promise you, I was standing in front of Simon in May. Like, it was that magical. Wow. (laughs) So now, fast forward to getting on the show and, like, just, it was so stressful. I had a five-month-old baby. Is that Um, your daughter that you were talking about now? Yeah, she's going to be 12. Oh, so that's a five year. That's five months old wow. in the audition. If you look at the audition, she was five months yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. I had postpartum. I had postpartum depression. I was breastfeeding. I was getting attacked online. Like people would love me, and then there were like some people obviously that hate you. And I was just like, only there was like thousands and thousands of tweets wow. of, "Oh my God, she was amazing," and it could be like that one tweet that's like, <laughs> yeah, "She yeah. sucks," and I was yeah. like, and that's "Ah, you right, <laughs> yeah, 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 right." And I just now like I, I just wish I had Alex at the, in my life at that time because I was really by myself with my kids and I was a single mom and I just couldn't take it. Like it was so heavy, and then and then it 
And because my energy of I'm going to win, I know it's going to be amazing, I can do it, because it then changed to fear Mm -hmm. and, oh, my God, do I suck? Am I okay? Then I lost because now I'm manifesting that I'm not good and that I won't win, right? So um, I bring all of that up to say when you talk about um, people that don't feel good about themselves, you are creating that in your life every day that you don't feel good about yourself is the product of your reality. You know what I mean? So taking vitamins, getting an all of sleep. And I don't even, I, I can't even think anymore about the past and what happened to me. And I lost my airpods. Can you hear me? (laughs) Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, You it's don't, don't stay so stuck in the past. And it's like, Oh, that's so easy to say. It just makes me so angry that this happened to me or that happened to me. But I just, you know, I just urge people all the time to have good conversations with yourself Mm -hmm. and the things you say about yourself, make sure it's positive, listen to positive music, listen to stop looking at the media, stop looking at negative, you know, influences on social media. I had to stop. Like, honestly, I don't even, I used to love reality shows. Like I was even on one, I was on X Factor and then I was on another one, like a few years later. I don't even watch them anymore. Like I love, I love the beautiful girls that I see on those shows. They're like really pretty. And maybe I'll go to their Instagram pages just to see what they're wearing and stuff. But I can't even watch it anymore because I was realizing that it was really changing my own energy. Mm-hmm. My vibration that I was giving out into the world needed to change. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? My mindset Mm. needed to change. So I had to stop listening to that. And I had to stop going to the things that were trending that were negative. And I started putting into my life and into my space, more positive music, more positive people around me. If I was attracting really awful things happening to me, I think to myself, what am I thinking that brought this into my reality? Mm. And let me change my mind. You know, I love um, taking B1 vitamins because the B vitamins are really good for mood. And so I take B1 and I'm just really into healthy living and um, and working out is a really great therapy. (laughs) You know what I mean? So um, I just feel like there's so many things we can do. I'm not obviously I'm not saying I'm not urging people to go see a therapist, but I do know that if you don't want to go see a therapist, there's a lot of things you can do on your own to change your life, you know? Um, and I, I don't discourage it. I don't, I, I'm just, you know, I just want to leave that there, but I just, I do encourage people to work on themselves. And if they have an apprehension of going to see a therapy, uh, sorry, a therapist, and if you come up with that sort of mindset, it's hard to change it. And not that anything is so wrong with that. Just yeah. make sure you are doing something to make yourself feel good. Yeah. yeah you know, I, I, yeah. I, I don't, I just, I mean, that's sort of, that's because mental health is very important. It is super, super important. It's something that us, we all as a society have to think about, you know, um, education and the IQ, your your own personal IQ and how smart you are and how aware you are and what are you doing to make the, your environment and your world that you're creating around you, what are you doing to make it better? How are you helping people? Yeah. You know, all of those things are very critical. Yeah, and, and as I said, we um, you know, we, we, we in my service and my team, I'm the only black male therapist across my county, and and uh, so there's mm-hmm. not enough representation. So the lack of trust and there's a there's a strong yeah. sense of resilience because our parents had to yeah. deal with a lot. So they're like, look, man, you <laughs> yeah, have to work we're very resilient. Hard. We're yeah. very resilient people. I mean, you got to give it to us. Yeah, yeah. I understand that. <laughs> and, and so, but uh, but the the big thing I always try and encourage is to find uh, talk to people who are non judgmental. So when you do share, yeah, even if you go to church or go to a community or go to your coach, yeah. as long as then they're, they're going to yeah. listen and not be judgmental about you, and so you can feel yeah. safe uh, and learn to yeah. talk. So that's 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 the biggest thing for me is always to, yeah uh, yeah is to be able to do that as opposed to having yeah. to go to see a professional therapist is just to get talk to talk to people who are not going to yeah. judge you or pull you down. The um, yeah, do, that's know, a very smart that's smart advice. Yeah, I I think one of the things that you did say that I just that I caught on was but the fact that you mentioned how you went from being that confident to um a change to sort of fear because. When you sang um, Purple Rain, um, it was almost like, okay, yep, 
might as well rip up it up. She's pretty much won this thing. Um, Summer, yeah. you were just singing. But then we started to notice halfway through that the song choices had changed. And, and it, you, the, yeah. the, it's, so are you saying that you, you just started to feel, was it a pressure that you might, that people saw, saw you as a favorite? Or were you getting one or two yeah. people against you that, that really affected you? What do you think changed in, for you? Well, first of all, I just want to make it clear that, and this is not something that was publicized because it's not, but I want to make it very clear that after Purple Rain, I no longer chose my own songs. Oh, we were wondering why you, you yeah, because we were saying, oh, why, why is she picking that song? Because you seem to have known no. during auditions what songs to pick. Because yeah, it just it, it was good for your voice, and then we noticed that the songs yeah. were like, "Wow, that's what's going on." Uh, I was begging, I was begging for different song choices. I was begging for songs like Whitney Houston songs, Celine Dion songs, or um, Aretha more Aretha Franklin songs. Mm. I was begging for those songs. I've even had asked for a Michael Jackson the Earth song because Michael Jackson's mom had reached out to someone that I knew and asked. That, and said that she was a fan of mine. And so I put the producers in, in touch with the mom, with his mom. And um, I got eliminated the week before they did Michael Jackson week. And the song that I told them that I wanted to sing for her, they gave to Melanie Amaro. Wow. Okay, so there's a lot of things that go on in the background that that kill your spirit, that kill you that break your heart because you, you can't go out into the public and say it because you're like, okay, I can't, I can't tweet right now that this is not my song choice because I'm in the middle of the competition. Yeah. Right. And then when you get off the show, it's too late. Right. Yeah. So those things did occur. I didn't pick the songs. Um, mm. I was asking, I was begging for an in-ear monitor so that I could hear myself and um, they refused to give me an ear monitor. So then I would sing off key because I couldn't hear the music and I couldn't hear my vocals. And I was being set up to lose. That's that's yeah. okay. So so um I spoke to a producer after um like maybe about two months after I saw him on a walk. I was on um, Runyon Canyon, this, this famous canyon in LA. I was taking a hike and he was like Stacy, we know how to we know how to get a winner. The audience can vote for this person, but we know how to get them because basically we'll give songs, most popular songs to the person that we want to win. And then the audience is voting for the song. Mm. They're, they're subconsciously voting for the song, yeah, not even yeah, yeah. the singer. They're really voting for the song because they love the song so much, right? The singer obviously is great. Don't get me wrong. But if you sing a song that everybody loves, then it's going to be easy to get the vote. Okay. So when I'm in the middle of the competition and that kind of thing is happening, it definitely breaks you because you know that you're being set up to lose. Mm -hmm. You know that you're being set up to, because also another point is the, it's the judges competition. You, Simon Cowell is not going to come to America for the first season of X Factor and lose the competition. It's his competition, right? But are they aware of what the producers are doing? Or do you think that Who? they just, the judges? The judges? Of course. Of course. So it's not about that. Let's just mm. let's switch topics off that. But when you talk about that, that occurring, mm. and then um, there's leaks going on backstage and being twisted to the press. Like there was an article that was written, like something like I was a diva or something, which wasn't true. I didn't have any of that happen. Um, so again, it's, it's this, it's let the, okay, the audience loves her. She can win this, but do we want her to win it? So let's give her songs. Let's give her an outfit that is not great. I mean, I look at some of the clothes I was in, I'm like, this is crazy, you know? So, <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So, and it takes such a toll on you psychologically. And when you have, um, People like, oh, she lied about her past. And that's the other thing. It was like, look, I was saying that as a solo artist, I never I never had my big break. This is a solo artist, which was true. I never had I had I had put out my own demo. It's called um this this the six, six or seven songs I had paid for myself for an album called um My Soulful Side that I had produced. 
It wasn't through a label or anything. So when I put that out, I didn't even consider that as like an album. And then when I went public and it was like, I didn't really, I never got a record deal. It was like, oh, she's lying. Cause I was on a record deal with Warner Brothers with a girl group, mm. right? But my point was, you, I wasn't a household name when I came on The X Factor. I wasn't with Houston. I wasn't Mariah Carey. I wasn't Beyonce. So to turn it around and say, oh, she lied about her career was very interesting. Because then you have that. Then you have people saying, oh, she's a liar. She lied mm. about her career. You know what I mean? Like, it was so many things that I didn't have protection. I didn't have a publicist. I didn't have a manager. I, di- I just didn't have those things um, in place. So, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty hard. It takes, it it take it took a hard, hard hit on me. And so the, the effects of that for the next maybe two or three years after was just hit after hit after hit, you know? And so, Mm -hmm. um, that sort of answers, I hope that answers your question. So what do you end up doing after? Cause I I think for for most of us, when we watch the show and and, and we then think about, those who don't get the deals um what what does mm-hmm. life uh, after what a massive show everyone sees you knows your name are you expecting yeah. are, are doors opening and people calling up hey come on let's give you a record deal let's send you on tour or what, what's life after i mean you you do have certain you ha- i did i did do some shows i did have some opportunities and like you know i was telling someone yesterday in an interview X Factor revamped my career. It was really awesome because it took, um, here's someone who in the 90s who started on Broadway, who, you know, I had two albums on Warner Brothers. Um, I never had my own solo album, right, or career in the way that I wanted to yet. <laughs> um, but so, it, but it did help me revamp my career because now you have 18 19 20 year olds that know Stacey Francis yeah. who back in the 90s would not have known me because there was no internet right mm-hmm. so now now even now it's like oh she's on the x factor so it, in that way it was definitely helpful so I you know I I even got shows like people asked me to come sing purple rain because I was still a <laughs> bit one that people love <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. so you know what I mean so in that way the exposure that you get on a platform like that is just it's just priceless i couldn't pay for that kind of publicity you know it's just like for 20 million people to hear me sing for three months in a row it's priceless yeah. you know what i mean so in that way it was cool okay i mean how i normally start this is um i always because i get an international audience and so they, they it'd be great just to start off with where you were born and raised because it, it helps tell the story okay. of stacy france so where, where yeah. were you born and raised I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, um, and I I went to a music I went to a performing arts um, sort of high school. So um, I started I started singing in church at a very young age. I thought I started singing at four, but my mother tells me I was singing as young as two years old. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so I was singing in the choir all my young life, and then um, I did musicals in high school. And so at sixteen, I got my first professional job in the show that I mentioned to you called "Mama Want to Sing." And then later on, I was brought to London to star in that show um, uh, alongside Shaka Khan. Oh, how old were you then? And we did that. Uh, I was 24. Okay. So this was before Ex-Girlfriend, you you, you were doing the show? No, it was, act- it was actually after. I got signed to Ex-Girlfriend when I was 17. Okay. Okay. So so you were mm-hmm. singing in high school. So how did you then get into, because I think some of them, um, how did you get into, uh, how did you, how did that happen? I mean, and actually, I guess. When you were singing at that young age, what was your dreams and 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 okay, ambition? so yeah, right. Let me clear it up. So at six at sixteen, I got mom on to sing the show in New York. Okay. Okay. So they had a show in New York that was running in New York. So at sixteen, I was in the show in New York. I was starring in that show, and then I left and I did the ex girlfriend thing. And then when they went to London, I went to London as a star as well. So okay. just sort so of put that together. So, um, what was your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but uh, but as as a 16 year old and, and even 15 year old, yeah, did you was yeah. was was being in in music and entertainment was that your dream or was it did you was it did you stumble across it? 
you know, it's so funny you ask that question because people are always like, oh, did you grow up with the brush in your hand singing in front of the mirror? And I didn't. I was just sort of like growing up in church singing like literally every day. I grew up in a brownstone church. I'm um, sorry, brownstone building in Brooklyn where the church was like on the bottom and we lived on the top. You know, <laughs> okay. so it's like I was always in church and um, <laughs> so I was singing in church and I was always in choir rehearsal, and you know, prayer meetings. It's like part of my DNA, you know. Uh... And so um, in high school, I started getting these plays and I was like, oh, this is fun. You know, so I think by the time I got to like 13, I remember seeing my mom scene when I was 13 years old. We went with the, the church, took us on this church trip to see it. And I remember being up in the balcony and looking down at the stage and thinking to myself, I could do that. And it was I remember that moment so precisely when I mm. thought this thought, like I could actually do this part. Right. And again, it goes back to the manifesting thing and speaking things into existence because mm. three years later, my friend called me and he was like, they're having auditions for that show. You got to you gotta audition for this show. And I was like, what? I don't know. So I went to the audition and I booked it. And um, and then it was just like, okay. And then I stayed in that. And I, like I said, I, I got an ex-girlfriend from there because someone introduced me to someone else and I got the audition and then I went to LA and Benny Medina who's the manager for Jennifer Lopez now he yeah. signed me um and the group to to the to Warner Brothers at that time and then we did two albums with them okay I mean, because as I said when we started most of the uh, of our community kept talking about oh we have to ex-girlfriend doesn't get enough prop you know because back in the day you guys ex-girlfriend you know, was epic yeah ex-girlfriend so... <laughs> was epic but it, it, as I said, but when 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 because you you guys did come out of the, the gates, you know, both singing, dancing, you had you had the whole thing. Yeah. Um. But when yeah. we, but I, I think other groups like SWV and um Jay and stuff yeah. sort of, TLC, you know, 90, TLC. yeah, towards the mid and later nineties yeah. got a lot of the push, yeah. and so that's why a lot yeah. of people still remember and still have affection yeah. for you. So, um, when yeah. you when you join the group. And you had full force as the as producers because we we've known them from the eighties and into nineties. Yeah. Um, what was mm-hmm. it like being a solo person now joining a group who had been around for together for for a while? Because I know they were called Petite and they were together. So, was how was yeah. it joining into a, a group of girls who've known each other and you're the new one? Yeah, it was hard at first, but they they really welcomed me. They mm-hmm. loved my singing. Um, And I was too, I don't want to say I was too shy, but I think I was just a little bit too insecure Mm -hmm. to think that I could go have my own solo career. So it was like perfect because I felt like, okay, I'll be, I'll be on stage with other people, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, you know, it was just, it was fun. It was easy. I thought, okay, so they're already set up to do their thing and I'll just come in with them. But it it was hard because they did have a history, the, the three of them, they did have like that time together and it was some resentment not toward me but toward the fact that the other girl that that I replaced that she had messed up because they really wanted her you know as part of their dream because it was it was their dream that they had had for so many years but unfortunately they they had to get rid of her so that was a little bit hard um but they did they did welcome me and they were very very excited that I you know, that I came in and, and I gave them vocally what they were looking for. So you, in that uh, sense, w- sorry, go no, ahead. Please, no, no, please go ahead. No, I was saying in that sense, it was, it was a really nice blend. They were, we became a family immediately. Did, did you guys, did you join them before being discovered by Full Force or did full, how, how was the time? No, Full Force was at the audition. Full Force was at the audition. They had, they had, Full Force had already signed them okay. and they were already on their way and this girl messed up and um, it's not for me to tell her story. Yeah, but yeah, no. Unfortunately, no. right, she, unfortunately, they had to let her go. Yeah. And so they held these auditions to look for a new girl and I came to the audition. Wow. And what did they see in you that yeah. they thought, okay. It's Stacey so funny because I'll I'll never forget. I see the I, I know I see the I see the room right now in my mind. It's so funny because I remember singing and Bowleg and Lou immediately saying, "That's it, okay, the auditions are, are over." Kidding? And they wow. were like, "No, yeah." He he literally said that like right after I said he was like, "Okay, this is the one." And they were like, "No, we need to talk about it." And you know it was so funny. And then everybody started laughing and they 
it was because you know at audition you're not supposed to just get your answer yeah, like yeah, this yeah. like people say okay <laughs> thank you we'll call you and he was like okay this is good this we're good and I was just like wow. oh my god so yeah he was very funny about that as soon as I finished singing, it was like yep this is it you know I was like okay <laughs> so I immediately booked it right on the spot my goodness and so wow so yeah and then you guys go into I mean I, I, I you know you guys I mean so were you used to dancing? Because you guys were, yeah. I don't think people give a credit for the fact that ex-girlfriend did amazing choreography yeah. as, as well as singing. And and, and was Thank that a you. hard thing for you guys? To- That's so sweet. I'm so hard. I'm so, I, I feel so like good in my heart that you remember that because we work 10 hours a day. Wow. They made us dance 10 at <laughs> Monica. Her name was one of the girls. Her name was Monica. She was like, we got to get this. We got to get this. We're going to sing it and we're going to dance, right? And it was like, she was a great dancer. And so, and Tisha was too. So it was their goal to make us stand out from the rest by being able to really, really sing and dance. So we're like jumping over each other's heads. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Playing double dutch. And, you know, if you look at one of our music videos right now, you see us like jumping double dutch and jumping over each other's heads. And I broke my ankle and I still went on tour. Wow. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, we we definitely, someone said yesterday in an interview that I did, you were definitely before your time. And I, and I agree. I think I think Ex-Girlfriend was definitely before its time. It, it was, you know, the music was incredible, very danceable songs and really great singing, great harmonies. And we did what we did. We 10 hours a day, seven days a week, we were dancing and getting ready for those shows. So wherever we walked on the stage, it was it was pretty it was pretty powerful. It was yeah. pretty powerful stuff. I mean, because, you know, the um, so the groups that um, we all know about New Edition, but Troop to uh, to a lot of us were were amazing dancers who could sing and they gave new edition a run for their money it's just that they had the unfortunate yeah. situation with their record label and and stuff which yeah. which started their growth but they were amazing dancers and so and when yeah. you turn them in a senior hall they're doing their routines and singing you guys were the female versions of that doing the dance steps i remember seeing you guys on soul train and you jumping around yeah. and singing again picking yeah. up the stuff and <laughs> And that yeah. was not easy because most girl groups were not nope. doing that to that extent. So that was yeah. um, one of the hard things that we saw, um, you know, but for yourself, was that stuff that came easy or was it like, wow, I need to get up to the, because it's a lot, it's not easy <laughs> to dance, then get well, back into it, singing. Right. No, it's true. I mean, I think what happens is obviously it's like working out, you know, I, my first, the first album, I was a little chubby. And then I was just like, okay, I need to work this out. And then I started <laughs> training and, you know, because obviously when you're working and dancing that hard, the, you know, the weight starts to drop off and they just really, they made me into a dancer. I mean, I, mm. I had had a little dance training, like in eighth and ninth grade, I was doing some dancing, but they made me into a dancer and they, they always worked around me to make sure uh, and with me so that I could really, really drill it in. Oh, and like Johnny what, Whatever Gilla. I couldn't do, like... <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And it was so funny because like if I had to sing a really big note, they'd just be around me making me look good, you know? Oh, uh, you're the female Johnny <laughs> so, Gill. That's it, was, it Rick says now. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it's so funny to use that correlation because the girls love New Edition. I mean, they did a whole tribute. Yeah, they she did a whole tribute song to New Edition. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it's funny that you used them as a correlation because it's definitely who they wanted to emulate as a female version. And, you know, I remember Warner Brothers at one point because In Vogue was doing really well. They were like, we just want you guys to, you know, be a little more like uh, sexy. And we were like, nah, we just going to stay in our like, we're going to stay in these jeans and clown bad boots and jump, keep dancing around the stage. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned In Vogue because people were saying. Wait, when sorry, I'm... say it again. Okay. We... Oh, okay, right. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. No, it's funny you oh, mentioned. What are you gonna say about info? No, it's funny you mentioned info because when I said to, to the to the community, I'm I'm gonna interview Stacy from Mexico, and they said, "Yeah, what happened with the beef with Invoke? Was there a battle with Invoke with ex girlfriend and Invoke, mm-hmm. or was there name no. callings or anything?" No, no, no way. We never had any beef with Invoke. You know, people how they like to make up stuff. They want to make some kind of drama. We had no, we never, we never even met them. Okay. I don't remember meeting. I remember meeting Cindy and the other one. Um, but we never like if we saw them, maybe we saw them at a show, but it was never like or any friendship okay. or any okay. any so moment for us to even have a beef. 
Okay. Now, I think people wanted to create some drama because, you know, they like to create the girl group drama and they like yeah. to say, oh, girl groups don't do well together and all the stuff that they say. But we we never, no, we never had beef with them. Okay. I was a very big fan of it. I'll tell you a really funny story. So <laughs> my song was like, I think we had like a number three song on Billboard or something. And my friend had just gotten a job at Arista Records and she was doing like, this meeting, this press release party with TLC, I was like, I'm coming. I'm coming up to the label. She was like, okay. So I came up to the label and it was like all for the record label executives and stuff to just say, to just do some press stuff with TLC. And I think they had some people coming in, but it was really for like the executives to sort of just get to know TLC and sort of brainstorm about it. So I walked in and I'm like, can you sign this? And one of the, and I, re, I will never forget Chili looking at me and going, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm your fan. Like, I, you know, I'm a fan. They start, we started laughing so hard because people expected there to be some rivalry there. Mm. But I was a massive fan of TLC. I was, a, I'm still good friends with Lily from SWV, massive fan of SWV. So I, you know, that you always hear like people want to make out this negative thing, but I was a massive fan massive fan of Cindy, Cindy from In Vogue. And when I met her, I told her that. Um, so outside of that, I think maybe we saw them during the show maybe once. But okay. we outside of that we never, we never, we never saw In Vogue now. Okay. Well because you guys were different. <laughs> Why don't you come home? You know, now why don't you come home and yeah. do your little news? <laughs> yeah, I love that you know the song. That's so cute. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, That's I mean, funny. what was it like in your for your first album getting working with Full Force? Because they, um, as producers, you know, a lot of people forget that they were, mm-hmm. you know, for, apart from Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam, they did a lot of stuff yeah. backstreet boys and sync and all this stuff but yeah when they were producing you yeah. guys what was it like being with yeah they work they work really well as a team they each person wears like a different hat like jerry does the tracks really um and then uh like paul does like the lyrics you know what i mean like he helped yeah. us with our vocals and our harmonies and stuff so everybody in the group sort of wears uh-huh. a different hat they brian you know they all they all come together at the end of the song and have their input but Really, while we were working together, we kind of knew like if we had a track consideration, we'd go to this one. Or so it was. It was a pretty cool thing. It was hard um, because you know you're at at this point in my career wearing a business hat. I would never go into a deal like that because it's just like <laughs> too many people. It's just too many people, you know. Um, so um, <laughs> it's just too many people getting paid out of one song, you know. So, um, but I would say genuinely from my heart that it was a really great experience and mm. working with them when you listen to the music you hear so much talent yeah in the whole family when you think about full force and the singers it was such a it was such a t- talented team of people making really great music yeah so then the second album um i think x max the spark you had yeah, an R. Kelly song. No, X marks the spot. So X marks the spot is the first album, uh, and women's a woman saying it's, it's a woman saying. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's okay. You had you for me, which <laughs> for most of us, it, I don't think anyone knows that R. Kelly did that because it would it be. And so I'm saying to myself, you've got an R. Kelly. R. Kelly is the biggest writer producer at the time. Anything he touches goes goes to platinum. But that song just went yeah. under the radar, and I'm thinking. Yeah, there must be something other than because it's not the song. It must be that they didn't push it. What 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 was your thinking about the yeah. second album about why it your second album didn't grow up and especially having a bit a single buy from R. Kelly? Whew. you're pushing a lot of buttons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, you know, I think it's so very self explanatory when when you get when you get into. Um, when you have an album on a big label Mm -hmm. and you have a big producer like that and the song doesn't really fly, then you obviously know that there's legal things that are going on in the background that people have just not worked out. You know, it's like, there's no reason that that song wasn't like one of the biggest songs in the world. You know, that should be the song that we're still touring on right now, 30 years later. Right. Mm. But, um, but it's not. And it's because there were too many hands in the pot. That's all I could say. I mean, it's just pretty obvious without me having to say it, that something went on with the paperwork or with the logistics of that record, because R. Kelly 
at the time was at the top of his career. It was yeah. around the time, I think, when he was doing like, I believe I can fly, like yeah. all these massive hits. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we went to him for a record. I remember um, my lawyer was like, look, we need to go to somebody that's got a big hit record right now and have them write for you. And we did. We fought for that. And at the end of it, it, it just didn't go anywhere. And it was because we just didn't have the 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 push from label. Because, okay, yeah, I'll drop, I, I feel like I'm dropping bombs here. It's just background stuff like I did with X Factor. Okay, so basically it was Warner Brothers, Reprise, the label Reprise through Warner Brothers, and then Forceful Records. So we weren't signed to Reprise Warner Brothers. We were signed to Force for Records, who was signed to Reprise, who has a thing through Warner Brothers, right? So it's just like all these vias that we, we as young girls, when you sign on a record deal with 17 years old, you're not thinking about any of that. You're just thinking, I want to go see. Yeah. And so you get screwed. You know, we don't, we can, we all came from the ghettos. We didn't come from, you know, families that had lawyers in them that was like, here, we didn't sign this and you're going to sign this you're not going to sign this album because this is a horrible deal that you're signing. We just want to go sing, you know? So um, that was pretty much what happened with us. We didn't have protection and we just signed really bad deals. And so when you look at so many songs on those albums that should have gone really, really well, unfortunately they didn't because we just, and I would love it to do a conversation with Lou with Lou or Paul one day from Full Force because I'm sure there's things that I don't know because I know for sure in my look, in my heart, deep in my heart, I feel that they did care about us. To have us sign contracts like that, it's just a little bit baffling to me even today. Um, so some of the questions you would have to ask them personally, because honestly, it, I'm just as confused as everyone else why that would occur. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. Because it was a R. Kelly record. We went to Soul Train and performed it. And, you know, at the time, anything that R. Kelly at the time was touching was turned into gold. Yeah. I Platinum. mean, I, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I did interview Lou but that, about a year ago, but I, uh, for, for, well, it's almost two and a half hours, but I, um, and um, yeah. actually, he got in touch with me just uh, a week ago. But, um, but I, as I said, it, but yeah, and 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 if, unfortunately, I didn't make the connection at the time. Yeah. Um, um, but, yeah. yeah. But and I, and I think a lot of because as I mentioned, a lot of my guests, even from Elder Barge, have all talked about how the labels and and politics and and if they don't push, if they don't, yeah. if there's a, if there's stuff happening, they would just drop the ball, and it's like you know what, this is a problem yeah. we just don't want to deal with. Um. So that's right. But and and but we we. we what we do in halftime chairs celebrate, I suppose, to try and dig out dirt and, and pull anyone down. Um, but I, as I say, a lot of us no, were exactly. so shocked with, with such a powerful track and 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 the album and, and the energy yeah. you, you girls had, especially when the nineties yeah. was for the groups and for when when R and B was at yes. its core, and then you had other groups yeah. like S W V and stuff all flying coming up and and, yeah. and going from one strength to another. And so, okay, so when you talk about that, you know, when you because I do want to, I do want to, I want to say this, and I feel like I've never said this publicly, and I do want to, I do want to say this. When you say that, right, and you think about um, how hard that must be as an artist to digest that loss, because it's a loss. It's like having this beautiful baby, and the baby grows a little bit, and then the, the baby dies. That's it's the tra it's that traumatic for an artist, right? And I think. That sort of death and the music sort of like not being heard and just not, it's, it's, people don't understand how traumatic that can be. You understand? So here we are with that trauma and feeling like, you know, I didn't, that, that could have gone better. People, people like you who heard it, people even now who, who listen to ex girlfriend, like, oh my God, I can't believe you were an ex girlfriend. And it's funny because it's like a little bit of a resurgence because I remember for a long time, there was no mention of ex-girlfriend and now there's like all these people. And you know why? Because people are missing R&B music. Yeah. And it's, it's this big gap and now people are re reaching for it, right? But at the time, it was a loss. It was a devastating situation for me. And I, for, for a long time, was very bitter and hurt and angry. And there was a lot of resentment that I had there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I had to heal through that too, because I can't hold on to that and think, you know, I, there's no way I can hold on to that and continue to grow musically and mm -hmm. as a woman and as a person. And so 
I want to give thanks to Lou and I want to give thanks to Paul and I want to give thanks to Full Force for giving me that opportunity because they did see something special in me and they did give me a chance. So I, there's no way it would be it would be very wrong of me to be in an interview situation and say, oh, my God, they dogged us out. And blah, blah. No, I don't. I wouldn't. I'm not, I can't walk away from this interview and say that they gave me a great opportunity. They they I went to places in the world that I could never have seen had it not been for the opportunity they gave me. I love the girls. It was a phenomenal opportunity to dance with them and sing with them. Of course, we all wish that it could have gone differently and we all wish that, you know, but it is our responsibility in this day and in present time to create a different reality for ourselves. An ex-girlfriend will always be a beautiful golden part of my life. And I will acknowledge it as that from now on and not as something that was bad, but yeah. something that taught me and something that helped me grow as an artist and something that I really loved in the moment. And yeah, there was heartbreak in it, but the, when it was alive, it was beautiful. Yeah. And so I want to give thanks to them for giving me that opportunity because had it not been for them, um, I, you know, they, they would have been this big gap, you know, it could have been a, whatever, we don't know, you know, we wouldn't, obviously we've been talking about the phenomenal um, music that we did. So that is a part of healing. And that is a part of growth for me, because for a long time, I was like, I don't want to ever talk about them. And ah, they didn't exist, you know, but they did. And they gave me, they gave me, and they, it was beautiful. And they gave me a chance to shine and, and go on big stages that I never, you know, would have dreamed of going on even as a young girl. So I do want to take a moment to thank them for that. Yeah. I mean, and, and work with R. Kelly was, <laughs> was epic. You know, it's just like being in the studio with a legend like that was epic. It's hard. It's hard to see what he has turned into. Um, mm. But boy, this man is one of the most talented artists that ever walked the planet. And so it was a blessing. We didn't we never saw anything that was inappropriate when we worked with him. We, he never crossed any line with us. And we were young, beautiful girls and he was respectful with us. And we did some great music together. Yeah, I mean, as I said, for um, for someone like R. Kelly, I mean, um, spoken to yeah, Cassandra from Changing Faces. I mean, a, a lot of other groups yeah. who've who worked with him. So they and we focus on the, yeah. on, on the music and 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 we recognize the talent yeah. and 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 then we 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 understand right. this the other things that the other side are, are things that um, don't not everyone would see a, a witness, but focusing more more on on the magic of the music because the music stays a lot with, right. with, with with us. That's right. After the album, because what you know, thing is with like, um, I I spoke with um, um, Claude um, McKnight from Take Six. And, yeah, I, we're friends on Facebook. <laughs> uh, well, uh, the, the thing is, because he was they were signed to Reprieve, um, but yeah. he they were signed directly to the label, uh, yes. Warner Nashville, and they were handed uh -huh. a contract that was handed to most country artists which is okay better terms and conditions than any r&b act and, yeah. and, and, yeah. and 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 one of the things that i noticed from what they what they because of that unlike 90 percent of the artists who i've interviewed they weren't they they, they dealt with a white let record executive who gave them yes. almost a white contract and unfortunately i think yes. a lot of our r&b acts were, were caught up yes. with them um, and this is not calling out any any groups or anything. We're caught up in that industry of okay, we got uh, messed up when we were, when we signed, so we need to make ours back from from this group. And then you, when you yeah. guys get established, yes. you, you take yours back. Yes. And that seems to be yes. the, the yes. stuff that. Yes, yes. Did you learn a lot about the industry? <laughs> like this awful domino effect, <laughs> the right? Awful oh domino my God. effect. How much of That's that did horrible. you did you, were you able to take? Because when you after that second album. Were you guys dropped by Warner or did you? No, 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 no. We weren't dropped. I left. Oh. We weren't dropped. I left the, I left the group because at this point, my, um, it, again, it was very traumatic. And my lawyer, who was the person that was getting us out of the contract and really helping us, he had a massive heart attack and died. And oh. I was just like. Oh, this Lord. cannot get any worse. This this cannot get any worse. And so when he died, um, I had done, we had done an album release party in New York City. And 
um, the producers of Mama I Want to Sing saw that 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 album release party and they asked me to come to London to star in the show. And I was like, yeah, I need to go make some money and I need to, I just need to, I need to get away from this because it's just so hard. And at that point it had been seven, eight years of just two albums that didn't do well. Um, and it was just like, I love the girls and I love traveling and I love doing the songs and stuff, but it was just like, this keeps going. I mean, when he died, it was just, it was hard for all of us. Like we all felt lost because he was the one that was protecting us and sort of putting in those conversations to help change the contracts. And he died. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to go and um, do something else. And then, and then it wasn't my intention to leave the group, like quit the group. I just went and got that. I went and did that show. When I did the show, it caused a bad effect. So um, that's kind of where it, it, it went. Okay. And so uh, when you did the show, was it the, you went back to do it in New um uh, Was it back in New York you did? No, I went show? to London. Oh, you I came? Okay. I started in the West End on that one. So in the, in the that's 90s, when that's when you came to, oh, okay. In, in the, in yeah, the 90s. that's when I left. I left I left New York and I went to London and I, I lived there for about a year. Okay. And then mm-hmm. so coming to the UK, doing doing the shows, did, did you feel like a, a sort of a release? Did it feel like a, a different, how was that? Uh, well, it was definitely, it was it was unbelievable because Shaka was in the show. So all these massive stars were coming. Shaka wow. Khan played my godmother. Yes. And um, Prince came to the show twice and Luther Vandross came and like uh, all these massive stars from America came to see the show. I remember meeting Marvin Sapp. Um, wow. all these really amazing artists and um and Prince he came the first time he came the second time he he actually invited me to come sing with him at the Emporium in Soho so he would do his show in Wembley and then he would do this night gig in the, in the Emporium in Soho and he would have me and I I went and did that with him for like a month like every night like he'd just go to Wembley and then go to this thing and I would hang out with him from like two in the morning to like seven or six at this Emporium <laughs> singing wow. one song sweet thing and like playing his tambourine with friends and then he flew me to Minneapolis and I recorded some song with him um and then wow. I, you know and then that then I know. And then after that, I came back to America. And um, after the show closed, yeah, I came back to America. And I did another show with the same producers uh, called Born to Sing. I did that at Madison Square Garden. And then they did a smaller theater off-Broadway called the Union Theater on 14th Street. We did that for a while. And then when I was in that, some Broadway producers um, asked me to come star in Smokey Joe's Cafe. And that's when I got my first Broadway credit. And I stayed at Smokey Joe's Cafe for... I think about two or three years and then I did Footloose wow. um, from there. So then I, then I got caught in the loop of Broadway. So I did like three Broadway shows and I was there for about six years. And then I did um, TV. I did a TV show um, a drama on NBC. Here is a massive network um, called third watch. And then I got like the TV bug of like, Oh my God, this is cool. So I started acting and then I, Moved to LA. I did a bunch of sitcoms there and did all the acting stuff. I started studying acting with Richard Lawson, who's actually Beyonce's stepdad. Um, he's my acting coach for many years, and um, and then it just it just I got a movie. I did a movie. Actually, I did a movie um, before that, like during ex girlfriend days. I did a movie with Tom Hanks and Bruce Willis and Morgan Freeman and Melanie Griffin. <laughs> what movie was that? And then. It was called Bonfire of Vanities. Oh yeah, I remember Bonfire of Vanities. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was in that movie, and um, and then, um, so then I did I did bigger roles in like sitcoms. I did many, many, many sitcoms, guest appearances, and Alex was just reminding me of when I came to London two years ago. I did was it two years ago, Alex? Two or three years? Or two? I think it was two summers ago. I played a nun in a show, um in a show in the theater in, in the West, right off the West End. Say it again. The Yeah, Bear the Pop Opera. I did that. And then I did Aretha. And I started as Aretha in the musical called Respect. I've skipped so much stuff. But just, <laughs> yeah. And then I, and I, um, I, and that was with Adrian Grant, who produced Thriller Live on the West End. So I toured with them and then COVID struck. And I lived in, I was living in London for three years. But I mean, I got to go all the way back because I kind of skipped a lot of stuff. But then, okay, so I did the 
I did the Broadway thing. I went to LA. I moved here. I did television. I stopped for a long time. Like after that, I had a baby, and I just, I just stopped. It was just like, okay, this is just disappointing. And then I did the X Factor. It kind of revamped everything again. Um, then I booked Celebrity Big Brother UK. Ah. <laughs> yeah, Do you, you know me being on that in 2017. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, I think because um, um, Ray J was on it as well, was he not? Yeah. Okay. Yes, he was. Yes. They snuck him in. I didn't know he was coming. <laughs> By the way, I was in the kitchen or wherever I was. When he came down those steps, I was like, oh, my God, this is horrible. Because I hadn't seen him since that 2011 incident. And so when he came down the step, I was like, oh, this is some shady stuff right here. They brought Ray J in the house. I'm supposed to live with this dude. Oh my God, it was crazy. So my last, <laughs> my last two guests uh, last week was Monifa, and the week before that okay. was Brownstone. So both Nikki, okay, and and Monifa, yeah. uh huh. And and I yeah. hadn't watched them R and B D because we, they don't show it in the UK. So, oh, uh -huh. but mm -hmm. both of them brought up R and B divas and 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 different yeah. things and, and stuff and so. But your yeah, name was I mean, mentioned. Yeah, I forgot about that. I did. <laughs> yeah, I did R and B divas. Oh wait, who mentioned these? Nikki. Oh goodness. Um. Oh, who? Who? Because if they were brought, was it Manifa? Maybe it was Manifa about the uh, okay. um, Whitney okay. Houston situation. Um. Cause, uh -huh. No, because it was Manifa because she was talking about how the show got on. They picked up the show after the buzz around. We were trying to film a pilot oh, and, okay. and, and that night and, oh, okay, and you guys okay. were all at yeah. the club and, and after that they picked up the yeah. show and, and I couldn't, yeah. you know, yeah. And so, and of course I didn't put two and two together because I, I still remember the whole is, is situation, but I never, you know, it's hard to pinpoint yeah. a broad, how, did, how yeah. much of an effect was that on you? Because it, it it's, it's almost like that also brought you into the spotlight, but not in the same positive way as the X Factor yeah. at the time. Um, and I yeah. think I saw you on CNN and different places, almost trying to defend yourself. How how challenging was was yeah, that? I, I I wouldn't go into that conversation. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. I, I stay I stay I stay away from that topic because, for obvious reasons, it's it can just it's not it's it's it was a dark time, and I don't I don't think it's very healthy for me to talk about yeah. that, and I don't want to. Yeah, no, not definitely, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, but then, but um, did you start to get friends with you know this because Nikki and and all these all these people did? What, well, I knew Nikki from uh when I was doing the X Factor. There was a producer that knew Nikki, and I think I had gotten in touch with her a little bit, and she had like tweeted some things, and I knew she was from Brownstone, obviously, but I didn't know her before that, and um, and so uh. Then, then that whole incident happened, and she, you know, she was one of the people that was calling me, and and like I said, you know, at the time when I did the X Factor, um, broken pieces and broken parts of me and disappointments and stuff, and that creates a different kind of energy, mm. you know, and so then you attract into things, you attract things into you, and incidents into you that only make things worse if you're not on a positive vibe and if, if you're not emanating light as much as as much light as you can. So um, I think that that that's a part of it. You know what I mean? If you're walking around in fear and you're walking around in anger, then you're going to pull in those incidents that and create more of that. And so I'm really happy at this point in my life to have done a lot of work mm -hmm. and a lot of healing. I lost a lot of friends and it was a, obviously a very traumatic time for me. And it's not something that I, that I think with um, so lightly having a conversation about so publicly anymore because it hurt a lot of people. And my life was very, very shattered at the time and very changed by that incident. And my anger allowed me to keep talking about it and relishing in it and sort of repeating it. And um, at this point in my life, because I'm totally in a different space, mm. I think it's healthy for me mentally. When you think about mental health, I think it's very mentally healthy for me to just talk about really wonderful things that occurred in my career and really amazing things and how amazing my life is now. 
with the man who really loves me and my family who really loves me and how much healing that I've had to do. I had to forgive myself on so many levels when it came to that incident, because obviously, um, you know, it, if you, it's, it, it's, it's kind of silly to even say it that that could just damage someone, you know, and that whole situation was very damaging. And, um, and a lot of people got hurt, you know, she, she passed away. It was like very traumatic for a lot of people. So it's not so easy to go into a conversation about it. Um, but I will say that through my own healing and through my own um, nonprofit work and the things that I've done to sort of make sure that I feel good about my life and, uh, I do these things because I understand very perfectly how important it is to speak uh, light and power into my life and into the power of others. So I don't, I don't engage in that conversation anymore. I think it's, I think it's healthy for everybody. Yeah, but I think one of the things that you've shown is the, the various bumps in the road, how it, yeah. you've come out stronger, and I think. When you Thank when we're you. dealing with a lot of a lot of us who are going through our daily grinds, we're not in public eye like you like you have been. Yeah, and sometimes it almost feels as if we're alone. And and having you share, yes. you know, your first your your, your record deal with with ex girlfriend, then um, yeah, going on X Factor, then having to deal with that, and still still falling down but still getting back up and still being able to yeah. be shot and and I think yeah. that's those are the stats that's yeah, you the, know, the, yeah. you you start to I, I'm gonna tell you you know just for total transparency and so anybody who's watching can, and listening can understand when you take hit after hit after hit after hit in your life right and it's like the loss after loss like oh the albums they flopped I mean we could just I could sit here and speak negatively about that thing, or I could switch my mindset and say, mm-hmm. okay, that happened, but it was fun. I had a great time. We had great music. It was beautiful. It was, it blessed a lot of people. People are starting to find out more about it now than they ever have. Like it's, it's crazy to think about how we sort of revised ex girlfriend has become, become in the last, I think in the last six to seven months, I don't know what it was. I don't know what happened. I think Somebody had an Instagram video and it kind of went viral and then everybody's like talking about ex-girlfriend again. Okay, great. So maybe I need to talk to the girls about us going on tour and doing something else and bring us back alive again, right? So it's like, okay, there's more of a possibility to inspire someone. Or I could just sit and be like, oh my God, I can't believe we bailed. And, uh, you know, or I could just look at it from a positive view. So everything is about point of view, right? And then I could look and go, oh my God, I can't believe... <sighs> I lost the X factor. Okay. Or I could look and see where I could take responsibility for why I lost the X factor. What was I looking at? What was I allowed? What conversations were I, was I allowing into my life to make me think that I didn't deserve to win? What conversations in my own mind was I having? Right. And then again, so I shift my viewpoint to, okay, what's the positive side Then now on the other side of it, I could be talking to you and you say, Oh, you inspire so many people to keep going. Okay, great. Now you got the incident with Whitney Houston. Okay, what do you say about that, Stacey? I don't say anything more about it. God bless her. She inspired me so much to be the singer I am today. I listen to her music. I love her. And I love her as much as the rest of the world does. And I'm so heartbroken and sad that we had that moment with each other because um, we are both very powerful women and both powerful singers and we are both powerful artists and we both in that moment deserve more. Okay. So, but on the other side of that, it's like, here's my idol in front of me and I loved her. That's it. Okay. So it's like, okay, so how do I take all of these things that seem so bad and turn it around for the good? And how do I take it? And so what have I done? I've made music really beautiful music. I have four or five songs that are all in the direction of good vibration, good energy, making people believe in themselves, knowing that they can make it, reminding people how powerful they are and this power of the words that come out of your mouth, how your words create your reality. This is a whole shift for me. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I walk so strongly in my walk and the reason that magic happens for me every day so powerfully now, and the reason I'm so happy is because of all the crap that happened to me. Because I had to go do the research and figure out why did that happen? What happened? And not blame anybody else. What did I do in that situation that created that effect? 
How do I now walk in my life to make sure that the effect that I create on people is positive? That when I leave the room, people were like, damn, wow, that woman blessed my life. You understand? Mm -hmm. So I know that the powerful voice that I have when I sing and when I speak um, and the effects that it creates, I know that I'm a powerful woman. I'm a powerful being. And I know that when I say something, it manifests. So if I know that about myself and have to take full responsibility for that power and make sure that what I say is good, Mm -hmm. what I think is good, what I know is good. And when that happens, my phone rings and I get a donation to my nonprofit. When that happens, my phone rings and somebody wants to buy Alex's art. When that happens, my phone rings and someone wants to produce a song with me. When that happens, you inbox me and say, hey, I want to interview you. Because now the universe hears that I've changed my mind. I've changed my speaking. I've changed my thought process. And I'm looking to help people. Because what the hell am I here to do other than inspire and help people? Mm-hmm. Nothing. That is my only purpose. Right? Mm-hmm. And it took me all of that drama, all of the anger, all of the tears, all of the heartbreak, everything that I went through to get to this moment with you to say to you and to your audience that if you can watch Stacey Francis go through all of that and all the drama and hear all the crap and blah, 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 and now see me today and me recognize the light that I am to this world, then you can do it too. That's it. That was the point of it. If I ever have to ask God why, then mm-hmm. my answer is for you to set a good example, for you to understand that the way to happiness is to set a good example. The way to happiness is to treat others how you want to be treated. The way to happiness is to honor the people around you that are here to help you build a great life and nothing else. That's it, right? So all of these relationships that I've developed in the industry, all the bad rumors, all the good rumors, anything is all for the good. It has all been for the good. And if I can know that in my body and know that in my heart and know that in my spirit and know that when I walk out my door, that I am one of the most powerful singers, beings, people, women on this planet that can create amazing creates on people and can inspire people if I know that then all my art that I create will create that all everything that I say is going to be something that when people walk away from me they feel amazing and that's the only thing I want as an artist and it's my responsibility as an artist to do that Mm. it's my responsibility to use my platform to inspire people because at this point in our lives where we are through all the hell we've been through. And when we look at what the media is doing and some of the communications that they give and some of the music that's being released, Mm -hmm. it is our responsibility individually to change it. And I I refuse to be one of those people anymore that contributes to anything less than that. Yeah. I mean, that's really powerful. And, and, you know, and I think that's the one thing that we, admire with artists is that you guys have so much power given to you by the creator uh, whether you're a painter or you're a singer or an actor yeah and, and sadly yes. not everyone uses that for the for the for the good and especially what is happening with that's right the music industry now is that the labels and people in charge are pushing out a lot of negativity and pollution and and, and not feeding us love it's true like we got in the 60s and the 50s and the 70s, lots of love and it's 80s. True. And, and so, it's intentional. Yeah. It's intentional. It's intentional. Let's not mistake. Let's not mistake it. It is intentional, right? But you have to know that. I, I you have, and you got to take some responsibility as an artist. You know, you, everybody has to, to everybody has <laughs> some responsibility for the condition that they're in in some way. You understand? And yeah. so if we all see that, because you're like the hundredth person that I heard say that. So if we all see that and we all know that, what are we doing about it? Is the question. And we can't fall into this victim like, oh, I don't know what to do. Because guess what? The universe can communicate with you. You can communicate with it. And you will know what to do. When I was so broken and torn apart and I was tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired <laughs> is when I was like, okay, I, please... Please, okay, I'm ready. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. This is enough. 
okay, is when all of a sudden I started pulling in books and people and, you know, whatever, a YouTube video, or I don't know, a damn sign on the bus, something, the universe started communicating with me in a way that I was ready for. Mm. Right? These are not mistakes. We all have the same power. You have the same power that I do. Everybody that's listening to me that hears me say, I'm a powerful being. You are too. We are all gods walking around here on this planet. What are you doing with your godlike power? That's the question. Yeah. You're going to use it for your good or you're going to sit there and keep being your phone all day looking at TikTok videos, trolling? <laughs> what, what responsibility are you going to take? We all have the same power. We all come from the same dynamic, supreme being, whatever you want to call them. What, we all come from that. We're all pieces of it walking through on this planet, having this experience in the dirt dimension. Don't get me started on that kind of conversation. <laughs> but that's where we are, right? Yeah. So how long are we going to stay asleep? How long are we going to pretend we don't know? You know, you know, you know. That gut instinct that tells you, your perception that tells you, your that thing that when you say, oh, I knew it. Damn, why did not I choose something different? You knew. So yeah. trust yourself more. Stop invalidating, you know. You know, when you talk about um, self-doubt and stuff, we don't come here with self-doubt. My babies, when they were little, I remember my daughter, was, when she was three years old, I'd be like, oh my God, you're so cute. And she's like, I know, right? <laughs> if I ask her now, you know, if I say that to her now, she'd be like, shy, like, Ugh. Mm. so when did she change her mind? She changed her mind when she went to school and some fool in school told her she wasn't cute no more, right? Mm. So here we are, self-invalidation is the accumulation of invalidations of others that you decided to agree with. Because mm. you ain't coming here and validating yourself. You know how powerful you were when you were three, four, five years old, yeah. seven years old, walking around perception, knowing, being feel like I'm a superhero. I'm going to put my Superman outfit on. I'm a superhero. And then mm -hmm. you go to school and some fool changes your mind. So stop listening to that noise and know who you are. Know who you are. And if you don't know, ask the universe to show you so you can start getting those signs. And when you see signs of, oh, this is great. I'm great. I know I'm amazing. Start speaking those conversations to yourself instead of the other crazy conversations to yourself. I don't get into those conversations with myself anymore. I don't mm. allow other people to talk to me like that either. Mm. Right? Because it's a matter of when you talk about mental health, that's real mental health. The conversations yeah. you're having with yourself. Yeah. Hello, somebody. You want to take my offering? <laughs> 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 no, with that, I mean, I appreciate and it. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you know, it, and it's good that you're saying this, and 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 this is the part of the the biggest part of what why I do this really is as much as I'm a fan of music and stuff, but I always try and and use this as a space for to inspire those who are listening because we're all going for stuff, you know, mm -hmm. things. The price of living is going it's out important. the roof, so hearing the, mm -hmm. these type of things, especially those who. Donnie McClurkin had we fall down but we get up um and and that's, that's very right. important uh, so that's the journey that that's you true. really said I've fallen out many times but I've got back up many again. times but I got uh, up and, and, and I have a and choice you, and you keep getting up and um what I about you and, and 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 that's and you know not uh, you know I told you I started off by telling you how much um my wife gets inspired by watching your audition and telling <laughs> Simon, Simon, I'm not going to this music. I, I wrote it down. I don't want yes. to die with this music in me. Music inside <laughs> me. Mm -hmm. That's, how That's I right. So, yeah, I don't even that, know where that came from. That well, just kind of spilled out of my mouth. <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> now, are I was you like, this is my moment. This is my and I was moment. holding it. I was if you look at that, if you look at that audition, you see me like, yeah. you like yeah. I'm a microphone. I was like holding it for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Who's the, who's the lady who do you baby? Because my wife said, "I wonder who that lady." It was who's... my cousin, my okay. cousin Stephanie. It was my cousin Stephanie who actually, um, we just we were in New York for a while and we spent some time with her. Yeah, she she's married to a, a man from Ghana and who was actually in London recently. And oh, yeah, okay. that was my cousin Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. No, because as I said, we she always goes through it each and each and one and stuff and. Uh, so nice. Are, are you are you still singing um Purple Rain in your in your in your arsenal of, of yeah. songs? Yeah. Yeah. I have to. People get mad if I don't. <laughs> Has Prince ever heard you sing it? Who? Prince. Did he ever hear you sing it before he passed? Oh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. I didn't those were later days. I didn't I worked uh, with Prince okay. in the nineties, so I didn't I didn't see him anymore after that. So I don't know. I mean I I hope he did, you know, that would be nice to think he did. I don't know. 
So what are we going to expect from you musically going forward? Because that is, I know you've done, you're doing the acting, you have your charity, yeah. you're supporting Alex yeah. with his art, but at, at yeah. the core of it, you've always been um, a voice um, that yeah, you've been given of talent. You. So what 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 what, are, what can we yeah. expect? I have some really hot songs that I'm very excited about. I, um, I, we re- I recorded a song about uh, two weeks ago in New York with some producers there. Wow. Um, uh, and that actually worked with Rodney Jerkins and, and the, the song is just fire. And I have another song that's called Hero that I'm very excited about that I think I'm going to release at the top of the year. Um, I, I definitely, I wanted to release like a six song EP, like right around Christmas and around the, around the, the resolutions time when people make resolutions, okay, you know, because okay. honestly, I've been listening to these songs and they just fire me up. They fire me up. They inspire me. I feel like, you know, they make me want to do anything and anything. <laughs> I, it, like they make me feel like I can achieve anything I want. In my life. So <laughs> I want, I want the world to hear them as soon as possible. So I'm very excited about them. I played them for, for someone yesterday and he's, He's a lot younger than me. He was like, he wrote me. He's like, I can't wait for these songs. They're fire. <laughs> so, yeah, I want people to dance and be inspired and sing positive lyrics and sing good stuff to themselves. And it's the it's a it's a small it's a short EP. It's about six songs that I want to release, and I've I've titled it "Empower Yourself." Wow. So it- yeah. So the industry has changed where you can, you know, you don't have to be signed to a label to bring out the music, but then it yeah. has its, its benefits, yeah. which is you can get it out when you want, how you want it. But it has its also it's the fact that you don't have the, the actual engine to push it out. What is then the yeah. expectation as an independent artist when it comes to getting your yeah. music out? What What is your sort of like, this is my expectations as to what you yeah. expect? Well, it's funny you, you mentioned that because I had a meeting with someone on Friday about that because some of the songs that I have, I have a song um, that I have two songs that are up for Grammy right now. And um, mm-hmm. one of the songs is called We Stand Together and another one is called Eco Echo. It's a tribute to Mother Earth. And those songs can be found on um, iTunes. And so um, I'm really excited about those songs. Um, I am I am being considered for Grammy for those, which was so we're gonna go to the Grammys in February. Oh, you, oh, you, oh, actually, have actually been oh, you actually been nom- nom- nominated, Grammy nominated for those yeah, two songs. Yeah, two songs. Wow, yeah, congratulations! That's very exciting. Wow, because thank you so much. A lot much. of people were doing for your consideration. So I, when you said, I wasn't sure if, but so actually you, you, you both, you got nominated in two. Yeah, points. I just spoke to, I spoke to the Grammy committee on um, Thursday and it's a special merit award. It's a, it's a category called um, the song for the uh, best song for social change. Wow. And my songs are, um, are definitely being considered now for Grammy win actually, because it's a different, it's a different sort of road than the regular, like, okay. um, regular songs so they didn't announce them and we were like all going like why didn't they announce it so we, we we talked to them last week and basically the songs are definitely um being looked at by the special merit committee okay so i'm really excited about that so we're going to go to the grammys in february for that in the meantime um we do have i do have those songs and i spoke to someone on friday and i was like i cannot put these songs out and the world never hears of them because they are just so phenomenal, you know? And that's the, that's the thing that happens. Like when you have like big songs like that and you want the world to hear it, if you don't have a major record label behind you, sometimes it's hard to get radio play or, you know, mm. to, to sort of make sure that you in the UK hear it. Now I do have a relationship with Ace over at uh, Radio One. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I might have him, you know, play it, but um, I don't know. I, I have, I have some, some some plans in mind to do a distribution deal with a company here in Florida actually that can get it on the radio and can get them played. So we, we are working on that mass distribution. Okay. Okay. I mean if 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 the songs are already out on on streaming services and, and on YouTube, is there do you have a video for them on YouTube or the two songs I just mentioned? Yes. Yeah, we stand together, yes, has a video. Um it has over a million streams on um Facebook. Wow. Um, and it is on YouTube. I'll send them to you before. I mean, I'll send them to you when we hang up. Yeah. So then, what? What? Because that's that's um, what my, my generation. So those of us who love the '90s tend to 
Um, very rarely do we go on Spotify, so we tend to watch, they listen to it on okay. YouTube, and and that tends to be okay. how we consume our, yeah. our music. It just seems like um, yeah. we don't we don't know how to do playlists and stuff. Uh, I'm I'm speaking uh-huh. general, but so if it's on YouTube, yeah, I understand. It, yeah, so yeah, it's I, on YouTube. It's definitely okay. on YouTube. I'll send it to you when we hang up. Okay. Yeah, so, it's very exciting. Yeah, well, congrats, and uh, I look forward to pushing those out. So I always end my interviews by Thank asking you. my guests that if you were stuck in an elevator and you had a movie to watch while before they get you out, in a way, what's your sort of favorite <laughs> favorite movie? That's that such you... a cute question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love that question. Um, okay, my favorite movie of all time is The Matrix. Wow, the first one. Yes, the first one. The first okay. Matrix movie is just so, it's so real to me in so many ways. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You, you are know, right. and um, it's, a, it's a really phenomenal film. I, I, I don't, I, honestly, I've lost count how many times I've watched that movie. <laughs> um, but that is, that's my favorite. I just love the, the, the overall message of that film and how yeah. powerful we are. I think I've spoken about that enough in this interview, but <laughs> now you see why that's my favorite. You, you heard me talk and you know why that's my favorite movie because yeah. I just, I feel like it's so much truth in that movie. Yeah, no, you you are right, and and I think a lot of people. See <laughs> Alex that. just yells out to me, "How about Twin Peaks?" Because he knows that I I just we won't even talk about that. Like that's his favorite TV show. He's like <laughs> every time I get like some weird show come on, I'm like, "This is some Twin Peaks stuff, Alex." I can't watch it. So <laughs> okay, oh, that's a fair. <laughs> no, me and my family, me and my family watch like movies every day. Like we watch every night. We get together. And we watch a movie. We watched yesterday. Um, you know the the movie yesterday. The guy with the beach, the, the guy who he woke up and he could play. He wrote the Beatles. Yeah, song. yeah, yeah. Okay. We yeah. love that movie too. That's a really cute movie. I I laughed so hard at that movie. <laughs> I love that movie too. That's really funny. So, and yeah, yeah. Oh, so we have watched a lot of movies lately because we're introducing. We try to introduce like those kind of movies to my daughter and mm. my daughter knows like a lot of music because we introduce her to so much music and she's she loves the beach boys and she loves wow. i mean she's just like so well versed at, and the beatles she loves the beatles so <laughs> she'll be 12 years old on saturday so she's definitely a very diverse 12 year old well i mean it, it is it is good and, and and i think the second part of the question then comes to what is your favorite all time favorite song not by any artist by anything your favorite like your creme de la creme when it comes um, to your song um there is a song oh my god i can't believe that it's escaping me it can't be my favorite song if i'm talking about <laughs> oh it is a song by india irie called i am light okay i think that i, I love that I am light, I am light. I love that song. So I've been on my path for just having really feel good movies and feel good music and mm. and just things that I consume that I feel are like healthy soul food for me. Yeah. So I've been on that journey, I guess, for a while now. And um I Am Light by India Ari is a phenomenal record that I love and I suggest to most people that just if you have a hard day to just listen to that song and um, that one but I also I love 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 Karen Shark sorry Karen Clark Sheard she was somebody that I grew up on singing to so I love a lot of her music as well she's a phenomenal singer I mean I can, songs it's hard to be like oh what's your favorite song because to be honest with you it depends on the mood that I'm in like I'm, a, I'm always, I always have music in my ears or in my car or in my, depends on if I'm in a like dancey mood, yeah. I'm like, you know, I love I, Michael Jackson obviously is, I mean, he just has the beat of my heart sometimes. I what's your favorite Michael, Michael Jackson, Jackson, What's you know? your favorite Michael Jackson song? I love, um, so, oh my God, so much songs by him. Um, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough is amazing. <laughs> I love the Thriller album. I mean, I'm just, I, what'd you say? Man in the Mirror, you know, Man in the Mirror obviously is great. I mean, Michael, you can't go wrong with Michael. I, I was blessed to see his childhood room in in, in, in Encino. I went to his uh-huh. house and um, yeah, I love, I love Michael. So it depends on the mood I'm in. Like, it's funny when my family's not with me and I like, if I'm going to meet them to pick them up or something, um they hear me coming like I'm down you hear me like two blocks away because <laughs> I blast my music super loud with wow. the windows down I turn the air up at the side outside as far as I can get like the air like 
you know, I need the music as loud as I can get it, you know? So yeah, uh, well, music, <laughs> that's it, hard. I love music. So yeah, music, yeah, it, music it, makes me happy. It, it does. I mean, my all time favorite song and, and the reason why is uh, Michael Jackson's The Lady in My Life. And it's such a oh great! It's I love great it so song. much that I, I I I don't listen to it too often. Um, I because I don't want yeah, to yeah. Does it make you cry? Well, no, it's just it's just so rich that I oh, don't okay. like to listen to it too okay. often. So like, so it's I, so authentic, right? Yeah, isn't it so authentic when he sings and you hear him at the end like cracking, his voice yeah. is crying. It's I, like, I, I, yeah. oh my god, it's such a great record. That's yeah. a great record. So I mean, so he's 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 my all time favorite artist. Um, and and strange enough, because yeah. you were singing a lot of Prince, and it, and I and I grew up at a time when it felt as if you only had to you you like one or, or over the other. So I've never yeah been, yeah never watched Purple Rain. <laughs> I've never watched Grit Feet, any right. of his. I and I've never. I understand. And oh, I wow. and and, and strange so enough, I don't like anything Prince because I just. The rock part was was um was and I like what you did with Pepper Rain, but I just felt just felt too rock, and I'm not too, I've never yeah, got into I into that. that. But yeah, so yeah. so yeah. but yeah, but I know that. He, <laughs> so, but.